Hello everyone. I've just published my first book exposing the false teachings of my former religion, the Organization of Jehovah's Witnesses. The book is titled, Shutting the Door to the Kingdom of God, How Watchtower Stole Salvation from Jehovah's Witnesses. It is available on Amazon and other popular online vendors, as well as through your local library or bookstore. Let me read you a brief excerpt from the preface. Are you willing to obey the direction of the governing body? There it was, a loaded question I had been expecting. I was at what turned out to be my final elders meeting. The date was June 4th, 2013. At the table with me sat the other 11 elders of my congregation. Sitting at the head of the table was our young circuit overseer, Dean Jenkins. The meeting had been convened at the direction of the Canada branch of Watch, the Watchtower Society to address some concerns that three of the elders in our body had raised about my qualifications to continue to serve as the COBE coordinator of the body of elders. Most of the concerns that were raised turned out to be trivial and even petty. These were all incidental to what was really on the table. The branch office was concerned about my loyalty to the governing body. When Dean Jenkins finally asked me that loaded question, I did my best to answer it truthfully. I told him that I had always obeyed the direction of the governing body, remarking that every one of the elders at the table could bear witness to that fact. None disagreed. Perhaps if I had left it there, I might have avoided being removed, but I added the assurance, and I will continue to do so, but of course I will always obey God as ruler rather than men. You might recognize this as a direct quote from Acts 5.29, where Peter said the same words to the Jewish leaders in the Sanhedrin. I naively thought my reference to this Bible principle was bulletproof. After all, is there any situation in which a Christian would be required to obey men over God? So, you can imagine my shock at hearing some of the elders gasp in reaction to what I'd said. They'd actually taken offense at my reference to this verse. Up to this point in our meeting, the only question was whether I was qualified to serve as the Kobe, but now they were questioning whether I was qualified to serve as an elder at all. After a brief discussion, the CEO asked me to wait outside the meeting room in the Kingdom Hall lobby while they deliberated. I was simply not prepared for what was about to happen. If you want to learn what happened next, you'll want to get a copy of the book for yourself. For now, I'd like to say a word about what witnesses face when they try to leave the organization. In my case, I've been accused by former witnesses of leaving the organization because I turned apostate. That is false. Apostasy means leaving God and Jesus, not abandoning a false religion. What I am is a heretic and proud of it. Others accuse me of leaving out of pride or for some petty reasons like personality clashes. They're grasping at straws because they do not wish to face the fact that an elder of 40 years could abandon his faith in the organization when he realized it was teaching a mountain of false doctrines. Now, that is a valid reason for anyone to abandon their religion. A religion that teaches falsehood is engaged in systemized lying. And we all know who the father of the lie is. For me, the biggest sin of the Watchtower Society has been to pervert the good news of the Christ. Paul told the Galatians, there are certain ones who are causing you trouble and wanting to distort the good news about the Christ. However, even if we or an angel out of heaven were to declare to you as good news something beyond the good news we declare to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, I now say again, Whoever is declaring to you as good news something beyond what you accepted, let him be accursed. Galatians 1, 7b-9. After reading this book and examining all the scriptural evidence, I believe any honest-hearted, truth-seeking Jehovah's Witness will come to see that in their case, the certain ones who are causing trouble and wanting to distort the good news about the Christ are the men of the governing body and the ecclesiastical hierarchy established by them. You see, my aim is not only to show that the teachings of the governing body are wrong, 
but to provide evidence that they have known they were teaching lies and went about doing it anyway. This will be evident to you when you read chapter 3, Watchtower's Generation, a Bewildering Litany of Interpretations, about what it took for them to plan a seven-year rollout of the overlapping generation teaching. We'll see in chapter 4, debunking the false good news of 1914, not just conclusive proof that 1914 is a bogus teaching, but also how the governing body has misled Jehovah's Witnesses into believing that the date was foreknown as the start of Christ's presence some 40 years in advance, even though they knew this not to be true. Chapter 5, what you need to know about 607 BCE gives conclusive proof that 607 BCE is not the year of the Jewish exile. But more than that, we'll see how they have known this to be true for decades. In fact, there is a simple, a single verse in the Bible that disproves it conclusively. You may have noticed that the book's title is a strong indictment of the religion of the Watchtower Society. I feel that Jehovah's Witnesses have been victimized into accepting a false good news which denies them entry into the kingdom of God in much the same way uh, the, uh, that the Pharisees of Jesus' day had denied the Jews who followed them uh, admission into a covenant relationship with Jehovah God for a kingdom. Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut up the kingdom of the heavens before men. For you yourselves do not go in, neither do you permit those on their way in to go in. Matthew 23, 13. I believe that the same can be said for the leaders of the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses. And chapter 7, Who are the other sheep? And 15, How the Watchtower Society shuts up the kingdom of the heavens will prove that. Also, along the way, I'll, I'll share some research into the nature of the 144,000 and the great crowd, showing that the organization has had this all wrong for the past 100 years. That's dealt with in chapter 8. And in chapter 9, is the Great Tribulation a single event? You'll learn that the Great Tribulation is not only something not to be feared, but rather to be desired as a true child of God. In analyzing that, we'll learn that a verse in Hebrews, long used by witness leadership to, dis to justify their disfellowshipping policy, is totally misapplied. Perhaps the most powerful indictment against the organization is to be found in chapter 10. J.F. Rutherford invents the salvation hope of the good of the other sheep. That chapter covers two milestone Watchtower articles in 1934 that laid the foundation for the other sheep doctrine followed to this day by Jehovah's Witnesses. You will be stunned by the ridiculous lengths to which Rutherford goes to concoct this doctrine out of thin air. What is worse is that the modern organization hides this information from the rank and file. They surely don't want you to see just how flimsy is the basis for this cornerstone of JW theology. Nor do they want you to realize that, by Rutherford's own admission, none of this came through the Holy Spirit. Instead, Rutherford boasted about being in direct communication with Jehovah. That's right. He believed that angels were carrying messages back and forth between himself and God. What was it that Paul said? Oh yes, that even if an angel out of heaven were to declare to you as good news something beyond the good news we declare to you, let him be accursed. Galatians 1.8 It's all there in black and white. There are two big obstacles in the way of any Jehovah's Witness desiring to break free from their false religion. The first is overcoming the heavy indoctrinated idea that disloyalty to the governing body is disloyalty to Jehovah. Not so. The second is the quandary of, where do I go from here? To put the first to rest, we start with chapter 11, Is the Governing Body a False Prophet?, which examines the historical evidence between behind three failed prophecies, 1914, 1925, and 1975, and how the governing body has tried to cover these up in the manner of a false prophet. Chapter 12 shows there was never a governing body in the first century. 
And the next chapter, 13, who is the faithful and discreet slave, will disprove the organization's teaching that only the eight men in Warwick are fulfilling this parable made prophecy. The final four chapters are designed to answer the many questions I've encountered over the years from witnesses themselves exiting the organization, such as chapter 14, should I partake of the bread and wine? Chapter 15, what does it mean to become a child of God? The question of where do I go from here is dealt with in chapter 16, showing how it is essential to worship God in spirit and truth without being a member of an organized religion. And finally, in chapter 17, I share some practical advice on what comes next and how to keep one's faith outside of man-made religion. The book is available in hard copy, paperback, and in ebook format. You can also go to your local library, and if they don't have it, you could request it. These are the YSBN numbers, which you can use to search for the book on Amazon and on other online retailers. I'll also put this in the description field of this video. You can order the first three through Amazon or almost any bookstore, library, or online book retailer. However, if you want the hardcover with a dust jacket, my preference, you can't get it through Amazon as they don't print dust jackets. Barnes & Noble or other similar booksellers will be able to access that using the ISB number shown here or in the description field of this video. Thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to hearing from those of you who read the book. Writing it has truly been a labor of love.